All right, well today I'm out at X35, uh, Denellen, Florida, at the Denellen Airport. Uh, check out this 601 that uh, Joe put together. Now it's a little bit of a, a high interest to me um, because, um, well, one obviously is a, is a builder here, um, but it has a, a Franklin powered engine in it. This is my Zenith 601 XLB, which is the modification with a 235 Franklin four cylinder. 2018 is when I got it registered. Now that she's all dialed in, it's turnkey, flies great, plenty of power. A little backstory with uh, Joe here. When I, years ago, probably seven years ago, started to get into the idea of building an airplane, uh, Joe was building another one previous to this, which was the 701. Uh, 601 before this, and the 701 was my first one. 701 was the first one, okay. Yes. So, um, Zenith has a, a forum, I think it's called Zenith.Aero, which is kind of like Facebook for Zenith builders. And I had, like, like most people do when they're building, follow whatever uh, airframe that you're building. And Joe was on there uh, sharing his build progress on a 701, and at the time, he had uh, installed a Corvair engine. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm still interested in Corvair engines, and at the time I was very interested in Corvair. So I was, I was following Joe along through his build process. So I've kind of been in touch with him or following him um, for, for several years now. And now that he's got this, I uh, just figured I'd, I'd stop in and, and share what, uh, what he's done with this airframe. All right, Joe, so explain um, how you acquired this airplane and then what you had to do it to get to uh, the flight status that you have today. Gotcha. I found an advertisement of Barnstormer a couple years back. It was basically advertised in the wrong category. And I found it on Barnstormer. It was basically buy the engine, airplane is free. Well, since I already had experience with the 601, I'm like, wow, can't be that bad. Engine was zero time engine, out of the crate. I called the gentleman, he never answered. It took me about three weeks to finally get with the guy found out he was ill, he was in and out of the hospital. The day he got out of the hospital is when I contacted him. I went there, it Was I'm here in Florida, he was in Houston, Texas. I flew to Houston to see my father in Houston, went to visit the gentleman, Wade Jones, looked at it, looked pretty good, and I bought the airplane. And that was three, four years ago, and here we are flying that airplane. Um, when I first got it, there was quite a few things that were unfinished. Uh, motor mount needed a little bit of tweaking, the exhaust, uh, prop wasn't really set right, you know, we needed to readjust the canopies, uh, the gas tank had some issues. Alright Joe, let's talk uh, for a moment about the ailerons. Now I've seen several different Zeniths where they've got uh, this very unique, um, just solid aluminum that it uses as a hinge and of course you got the uh, old-fashioned hinge and this originally came with the aluminum what did you have to do to swap that out or and, and why yes that was the hingeless well my first 601 was the hingeless I don't know I like the option as a hinged aileron so I bought all the parts from Zenith and I converted to hingeless uh, to hinge and I like the I like the setup. I had to again rebalance everything as to Zenith specs, and here we are. It works perfect. Now the, the hingeless was that because I haven't seen so many of them myself. Was that basically the, the top skin, just it was a little bit longer and incorporated into the aileron? Or yes. Did, so yes. did you have to cut? Uh, a good amount of sheet metal out to be able to modify it? No, it's just a little bit longer. You just got to trim it and that becomes the hinge, which also works very well. But I like the, the hinge type, it's, it's a lot cleaner. But one of the things I hear uh, a little bit different from the 601 to the now current model of 650 is this B modification, which um, some of them had where you had to basically beef up the spar and some of the wings 
this was already started for you, but what did that look like for you? What did you have to finish up on the B mod? Well, once I opened up um, the wing to do the gas tank repairs, um, certain things were unfinished. You could rivet the spars or you can bolt them together. So Mr. Jones, he opted to put the bolts in, which was okay. So I just checked and retorqued, used torque seal, made sure all the brackets and the angles were where they needed to be, made sure everything was up to snuff. Uh, he did a pretty good job on the, on the, uh, the upgrade. And again, had to balance stuff and make sure everything was correct, torque everything down, and Zenith did a jam up job with, with their mod. Not only is it one thing, you actually went around the whole entire airplane to do that mod. So it wasn't just the spar. It was the balancing, the reinforcement, reinforcement under the seat, the, the main spar. Uh, it was a lot of, lot of upgrades. All right, something uh, kind of custom you mentioned earlier before, and that is kind of balancing the controls that you had heard from a friend. Uh, what, what did you do to the controls to uh, have a little bit of lighter feel to it? Well, this gentleman, Joe Hopwood, I believe is his name on the Zenith site. He came up with an idea to add rubber bands to the to the stabilizer main spar and to the aileron a little S hook. At first I thought it was kind of like a joke, but I tried it. And to be honest, nine rubber bands held the elevator in the neutral position. That allowed me now to use I would say 5% of the, ele the elevator trim compared to full trim to land. And as you can see, when I come in to land, I'm using maybe two degrees, three degrees of elevator on landing, whereas before I would run out of trim completely. So it does make a big difference for the stick force. Rear windows on a low wing Zenith, uh, and this was of your design. Right, well, I saw in the, on the Zenith site, somebody had some pictures, I don't remember the gentleman's name, and he had put rear windows. And I'm like, you know what, I thought that was pretty cool looking, it makes it look like a four-seater, kind of lightens up the luggage compartment. I would never do it again, because it took about a week to do each side, but at the end, I, I really like it. Actually, I wanted a different shape, but this is how it came out. So what I did was, once I got the shape, and transferred that same dimensions to the other side. I went ahead and cut some plexiglass, bent it in form. I heated it up a little bit to get that contour and made some L brackets and some Z bends and took, like I said, about a week and I'm very happy with it. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com, Aviation Youth Magazine at AviationUSA.com, The Aviators Clinic at AviatorsClinic.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video and visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. All right, so let's talk specs for a minute on your aircraft. This is the 125 horsepower Franklin and what kind of speeds are you seeing both at the low end, like stall and approach, and then what are you seeing at cruise and top end? Tell us all the speeds here. Um, I usually rotate at 60 miles an hour. By the time I get out of ground effect, I'm doing about 110 miles an hour, and I'm climbing out at 110 at 1,000 feet per minute. Now, if I climb out at 80, 
I'm doing almost 1400 feet per minute. I don't like that angle because I'm not Johnny Rocket, so to speak. So I usually leave it at 110. And in cruise, maximum RPMs on this engine is 2800. At 2600, I'm cruising at about 138, 140 miles an hour. Top speed, 2800, 2820-ish. I've hit 150 miles an hour at times. Engine's got plenty of power. Now you mentioned also surprisingly with um, you're using a Marvel Chevrolet carburetor and yes. you said in cruise at a couple thousand feet, what is your uh, fuel economy? Fuel economy, if I'm, I take off and I don't do touch and goes, I'm basically burning about five and a half, 5.8 gallons an hour. That's incredible. Yes, and that's maximum 2,800. Now, if I do nothing but touch and goes, it'll burn six and a half gallons an hour. So it depends on your flying. All right, let's talk about weights for a second. What is your uh, what are your registered empty and registered uh, gross here? Empty weight is about 867, completely empty. Uh, maximum gross weight is 1320, and the plane runs excellent at 1320. Even have flown it with a little bit heavier, seems like it performs just as well. Okay, now talking about uh, engine RPM, and you said you're getting to, to the max. Um, horsepower range with just this engine is rated at 2800 what did you do to get to that and which prop are you running at the beginning it came with an Ed Sturba prop it was a 6860 well I wasn't getting the right RPMs so Ed Sturba was nice enough he repitched it down you can't go up you can only go down he repitched it to 6858 wasn't enough RPMs. Then we repitched it uh, 68, 56. Still wasn't enough. Now we got 67 um, length and we got 48 pitch. And at 48 pitch, I'm getting around 2750. And that's better. But with this warp drive, 64 inch three bladed warp drive you're able to ground adjust it where you can adjust it to the rpms you need so i'm getting 2800. All right, now we got this thing opened up, and this is the engine you bought that happened to be attached to an airframe. Correct. So, yeah. once you got this, uh, was the engine st still in the crate, correct? No, no, it was on the mount. It was on the mount, okay, yes. so the mount was already cr uh, created when you purchased it. Yes. All right, yes. so what did you have to do up front, firewall forward, uh, to get it to flight status? Uh, it was quite a bit of stuff. Number one, as I can see here, I added an oil cooler. Um, added a remote oil filter assembly, um, carburetor linkages, throttles, fuel flow. I had to do quite a bit. The baffling was partially done, so I took care of that. Um, the wiring for the magnetos, wired all of that in. The master relay was there, but like I said earlier, I cut all the wiring out and I re rewired the whole entire airplane. So now there was no alternator. So I found an alternator from a, another pilot from the Zenith site. Got it from O'Reilly Auto Parts for 69 bucks versus a $700 aircraft alternator. Had the pulley design from a machine shop to accept a regular Napa belt. Took care of that. It's putting out 14.8 volts, no problem. It can handle the voltage. Um, prop situation, had to do some situation with the motor mount, with the rubber mounts, got that straightened out, and 
a little bit of tweaking with the exhaust. Um, had to design linkages for the carburetor to accept the throttle cables. Got that straightened out. And little by little, we're here, turnkey, ready to roll. Now you mentioned that you created your own um, lines and so forth for, well, for everything, but specifically I'm talking about the um, the spin-on oil filter. What what did you use for the uh, oil filter system? Oh, um, Summit Racing. I ordered the braided fuel line, oil lines, and bought the AN quick fittings and just measure and twist on your own fittings so you can make your own lines. And then I bought the insulation sheathing to insulate them from heat and fabricating all the lines custom, custom fit. 